Our fifth episode focuses on how man in the middle attacks can be leveraged to manipulate HMI views, Modbus TCP traffic, and even inject malicious payloads in users' web browsers. The latter technique being ripe for SOX and control center dashboards. Man in the middle attacks have been around for a while. Their purpose is to either cause traffic redirection to allow us to sniff that traffic off the local LAN, to inject packets, or manipulate packets as they process through the attacker's system, downgrade protocols, for example, going from SSL to HTTP, and even steal another user's session. There are many man-in-the-middle attacks. Uh, we're going to actually demonstrate a few of them, one of which is ARP cache poisoning, ICMP redirect, which requires a gateway IP address and supported by both BetterCap and EtherCap, SSL to HTTP downgrade, and then we'll demonstrate how to harvest some credentials from the uh, victim's browser. After the demo, we'll go ahead and talk about some countermeasures as they pertain to Modbus and IoT devices. The tools we'll be using predominantly are BetterCap, the Browser Exploitation Framework, Old and Reliable TCP Dump, Wireshark, and a Hex Editor. I have assembled a very simplistic topology to demonstrate these attack vectors. First, we have our web switch acting as our Modbus server and providing an HMI dashboard for easy monitoring and configuration. Opposite to that is a Windows 7 engineering workstation where the operator will be keeping an eye on the Modbus server via its web-based dashboard system. I used an open WRT router simply to make addressing faster for this demonstration. All devices are connected to a ruggedized Garretcom Layer 2 unmanaged switch. The attacker system is a typical Kali box connected directly to the local LAN. However, this doesn't have to be just an attacker as seen by the icons. For in fact, it could be malicious software on the system, a rogue device such as a, uh, someone connecting a uh, router, a wireless router to the uh, local LAN. And this happens at some substations because the operator doesn't want to have to get out of the truck in the middle of the rain or the threats inherent to BYOD. The first step is we need to enable IP forwarding on the attacker's kernel. Otherwise, our system will simply receive traffic without passing it on. This would result in a denial of service con uh, condition on our victim. We verify the setting using the cat command. Let's go ahead and take note of both the attacker's IP address, but more importantly, the subnet of the local LAN we are connected to. We'll also identify our gateway address. Now we can go ahead and execute ARP spoofing via BetterCap and enable its plugins in a single swoop. We'll go ahead and enable the sniffer, spoof ARP traffic, set up the web proxy, the HTTPS web proxy, provided the interface as well as our gateway. We'll log to the local directory bettercap.log and then enable the cookie, HTTPS, HTTP auth, SNMP, POST, NTLMS, and DHCP plugins. I'm also going to go ahead and prep our TCP dump to go ahead and capture on the same interface. Set the snap length to zero, very verbose output. Don't do name resolution, uh, but specify the host is going to be our target web switch um, gathering HTTP traffic. And let's go ahead and launch that attack. We see that we've identified the engineering workstation, his IP address. We've also identified the web switch, its MAC.
At this point in time, I'm going to go ahead from the engineering workstation, go ahead and access the web switches web interface. See that connection. And then we see a bunch of uh, state information being sent back from the web switch to the attacker machine, or excuse me, to the victim machine. We can go ahead and open uh, this particular capture within Wireshark. We've identi identified our HTML traffic. We can go ahead and follow that TCP stream. And this is going to give us the uh, all the HTML that was in the web switches GUI dashboard. Now we can go ahead and save this as the raw traffic because we want to actually extract this information and then recreate it in our browser. So we actually have a eyes on view to what the operator is seeing. We can go ahead and review um, our output and essentially we're just deleting the overhead, the header information, just a lot leaving us with the HTML. We can verify it's HTML using a file command. Everything's great, not a PCAP. Then go ahead and open that in our web browser. And here we see the entire web switch GUI as presented to the operator with the exception that some of the additional capabilities, for example, the, uh, the states, etc., cetera, are not, are not viewable um, because they're not enabled on the web switch itself. So we actually get more information than the, even the operator receives. Uh, some of these are in fact enabled, others are not. Let's go ahead and look for that on button. And then we see our states there, on versus off. The same can be said for uh, the command to reboot. Um, both of these states are assigned to a particular outlet, outlet one, outlet two. Let's go ahead and inspect this. And this provides, as you can see, a much easier way to parse that output, the HTML, and identify the states. Here we see a 1-1 one, one and a 1-0. So outlet 1, a state of 1 for on. After the initial HTML is downloaded, um, that connection is still open and those values are being continuously pulled. Uh, so the operator is presented with uh, the most recent um, data to ensure that the outlet has not turned off. If we follow the XML TCP stream, we can actually see that command being sent across. So each outlet has a state, one for on, zero for off. What we can do is essentially ed, uh, create a, uh, a filter. So as it's being passed through us as demand in the middle, we will switch the states. So anything that was originally on can now be viewed as off. So here's an example um, plugin from BetterCap written in Ruby. You can see the information where I obtained this. Made some modifications, but essentially all I'm doing is parsing the XML. And I'm looking for the relay state of one for outlet one. And I am showing that as being off. A 
All we need now is specify this module. Go ahead and run it. Go ahead and recreate our man in the middle session, identify the systems, and we see that that information is being passed and our, our plugin is working. We can see the output message outlet one off. So now the victim is actually seeing this is being um, passed through us as being off when in fact it's on. We can verify that in Wireshark. If we look at the XML now, we see that our relay state is being passed through as zero. Now the perform an ICMP redirect. Since we've already specified our gateway, we just need to uh, change the spoof from ARP to ICMP, and Bob's your uncle. So unlike the ARP poisoning attack, the ICMP uh, attack is really just sending redirect messages uh, claiming that we have a better route than the actual router. And to demonstrate that it works, I went ahead and logged into the OpenWRT switch. We also see some additional Rockwell um, requests coming through from the engineering workstation, which is fantastic. Note that this was HTTPS, so by including the uh, HTTPS proxy module, we've in fact downgraded um, the authentication protocol from HTTPS to HTTP. We also see that we have uh, actually captured the password and username um, for this authentication as we downgraded from HTTP to uh, downgrade to HTTP from HTTPS, um, we were able to strip SSL, thus uh, presenting us the credentials in clear text. All right, so now we're going to try to recreate the control system logic by becoming a Modbus proxy. Um, to do this, we're going to be using MBT get. Um, so in order to pull the victim device, I'm going to go ahead and SSH in to another system on the local LAN. Uh, this is just one of the VMs we used earlier, but it has MBT get already set up. So we can go ahead and start pulling those commands uh, from the web switch. Now, other alternatives uh, to this technique is, you know, try to monitor the HMI via the web uh, scraping techniques we just showed. Um, we could capture multiple screenshots in successive or, uh, order um, using the interpreter session or just obtain remote access uh, to the box itself. As we're focused on Modbus, I'll demonstrate how to obtain the traffic using a simple man in the middle ARP spoofing attack. Um, we just need to ensure that obviously we've enabled IP kernel forwarding and our IP tables rules are cleared. Um, once we're ready, we'll have to set up a better cap uh, proxy specific for Modbus TCP originating from the web switch. Um, note that we're also capturing the network traffic. So the only difference here is I'm actually using the TCP proxy module which allows us to specify um, the TCP port and victim. In this case, we're going to go ahead and use the web switch over Modbus port 502, sniff that traffic, and output that um, to a PCAP log for us. Go ahead and run.
we see that we've identified the virtual box machine. Uh, we execute the MBT script and look, we see the actual Modbus traffic going, Modbus TCP traffic going across the wire. Um, that was a read uh, coil command. Let's go ahead and write coil. And if any of these um, techniques are foreign to you, we invite you to go ahead and watch our earlier video on Modbus enumeration. So we went ahead and uh, found that the state was off. Uh, we changed it by giving it a state of one and then verified that with the recoil command. All is good. Now that we have uh, those packets, we can go ahead and shut this down, free up our terminal. Although in an actual um, uh, attacker perspective, you'd probably allow this to continue to run to get more information. Uh, we'll open up that capture packet, and then we're going to specify the Modbus TCP display filter of MBTCP. And then we can go ahead and scroll down in order to locate that right coil command. After finding the packet, we can review its contents and hex format, and even decode the values using Wireshark. We could go ahead and export this particular tra uh, packet, which would be helpful uh, in case we're using it as a template for additional fuzzing, as seen in the episode prior to this. Now, if we open the packet in hex editor, We can see the overhead, but more importantly, we can also see the Modbus TCP packet started off by the Modbus tra uh, transaction identifier. Another way to parse this is to go to modbus.rapidscada.net. Um, go ahead and select Modbus TCP and the request, then go ahead and enter those bytes into the uh, into one of the right uh, commands that we saw previously we'll go ahead and parse this and see it's a right function coil and the output is on if we went ahead and changed those uh, flag bits to nulls we would see that the output value of that particular packet would be off so now we're starting to understand um, the actual logic of the particular HTMI. In the entire capture, uh, we can see where those bits were signed uh, to be on uh, based upon hex FF. We can modify that in hex editor, review it in Wireshark, However, we would also need to change some of the, uh, the actual packet information itself uh, in order to replay it. So in the first example, we performed a simple search and replace for the XML data being passed to the web switch. Similarly, we can inject data as well. 
Um, for example, we'll use Beef here, the browser exportation framework. Uh, when you open it up on the icon in Kali, it will give you the URL to go to. Uh, you can log in with uh, simple Beef Beef credentials. And then we're going to go ahead and change um, our module to inject JavaScript and then give it the JavaScript URL um, of the actual beef hook itself. When we go ahead and run this, and remember all these uh, commands are in our show notes on hackmycontrolsystem.com, we can see that we have a hook as soon as the, uh, as soon as the engineering workstation uh, goes ahead and goes to our web switches HMI dashboard and there we have our cookie we have our hook and in the upper left corner um, you actually see that the engineering workstation was identified we can run some modules against it enumerate different types of information um, from that particular host Here I've noted that it is not a touch screen, so that would kind of help you in your enumeration of that particular device. We can see that it accepts a Visual Basic script. And what versions of .NET. We can run specific commands against the host. Here we're going to fingerprint the operating system, execute the command, and view its output. The petty theft option is pretty fantastic. We're going to go ahead and specify a Windows prompt. Execute it and it will essentially prompt on the other side of the dashboard or the uh, in front of the engineering workstation a Windows prompt that says, hey, we need to enter credentials. Someone on the box may think it was a valid uh, prompt by the system. Enter their domain credentials and we would collect it here um, through the browser. Now we have uh, legitimate credentials to begin pivoting uh, deeper within the control system network, especially as control systems often have their own domain. So absent to strong physical security, being able to reduce the attacker's ability to gain entrance into the facility and attach a device to the local LAN, there are some additional countermeasures that we can do in the cyber domain. Managed switches typically have more security capabilities embedded within them than dumb layer two switches. Simple improvements such as SNMP alerting and larger CAM tables can yield benefits. Configure dynamic ARP inspection per VLAN to drop forged gratuitous ARP packets and log violations. And since you're doing all this additional logging, you need to ensure log forwarding is set up and as well as provide centralized visibility to benefit from these additional capabilities. Now this can be either through Splunk, Elk, etc. Set up DHCP snooping and configure rate limit untrusted ports down to about 15 packets per second. Enable DHCP option 82 to facilitate device location identification and tracking. Configure VLAN ACLs to drop UDP packets delivered to UDP port 67. Configure port security. If you require DHCP for speedy recovery of a downed device, then at a minimum, ensure you are alerted via SM SNMP trap upon the insertion of a new device. And of course, there's always the option to embrace end-to-end -end encryption. Hey, thanks everyone for viewing this episode. Uh, we appreciate if you please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, we'll be posting the slides uh, on GitHub 
And as well, as, uh, as with all the other videos, our show notes are posted on our blog at hackmycontrolsystem.com. Thank you very much for viewing.